Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Well, not really. Today, it's Middle East Talk. Israeli elections in Netanyahu. Israel, Iran, and the bomb. Republican letter to Iran. Beheadings, bulldozings, and captive burnings from the Dark Agers. Strange bedfellows in the war against ISIS. Syria and Iraq. Do they exist? As usual in the Middle East, something's happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. To help clarify an always very complex and fast-moving situation is a frequent guest here, indeed, my favorite guest, Richard Murphy, former U.S. ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Mauritania, the Philippines, and Syria. He has served as U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern and South Asian Affairs. He has been named career ambassador. He has been a senior fellow for the Middle East at the Council on Foreign Relations. He is a frequent TV commentator and widely consulted international expert. Welcome back, Mr. Ambassador. Great pleasure. Let's start with literally what's happening right now, and that is the Israeli elections. What are the stakes involved, both for the United States, for the region, Israel, talk about this election. Yeah. Well, the election on 17 March, we won't know the results for several days, maybe even weeks, uh, as the president of Israel has to reach a judgment. Who can put a government together that will stay together at least for a while? Uh, this election comes two years before Bibi Netanyahu's term was to run out. He called for it. Uh, presuming he was going to win. Presuming that he would strengthen the right. position that right. the, his government was starting to crumble. Right. And he thought he could, by dumping certain members and going to, back to the electorate, uh, he'd be better off. And there's been questions raised. Is he going to be better off? Because the uh, opposition has turned out to be more appealing to the public than uh, he had assumed. Right. So you've got right now, <clears throat> just looking at the polling, which certainly isn't predictive, that they projected Herzog's party with uh, coalition really with 26 and the Likud with, I think, 22. Neither of those approached a majority of 61 that no. you would need to form a government. What's, what's difficult for a lot of my students to understand, or, and, and easy for others to understand, is this parliamentary system where you have to put together all these pieces. So conceivably Netanyahu could get more votes than his opponent and still not be able to put together a government. Explain a little bit of that dynamic. Well... Uh, Shimon Peres explained it to me once in very general terms, saying, look, we brought from Poland a poor system in terms of proportional representation, but we've succeeded in making it worse. <laughs> and this is a good source. <laughs> uh, that makes it uh, a devilish business trying to predict what the next days are going to produce in terms of an Israeli government. The electorate has moved to the right, as they say, and uh, Bibi Netanyahu has made a hard-line pitch to the right, right in these last days, in effect saying, uh, forget the idea of a two-state solution. Yep. That's just going to hand uh, territory over to Islamic radicals and terrorists, and uh, I'm not going to be party to that. So that's a pitch to the right wing as he tries to make sure that he can get maximum support there. Short-term electoral strategy may be successful, but what is the short, mid, and long-term security situation and international position of Israel taking that no two-state solution? Yeah. 
Well, it, it runs up against something, uh, a program the American government has been pursuing for a generation, yep. trying to find a way to get a peaceable relationship between the Palestinian people and the Israelis. And if you say categorically as head of the government, I'm not going to play ball with that uh, effort. Uh, in, in a way, it's more honest than, frankly, he's been on the issue. Right. He's, he's yeah. weaved and dodged over the last few years. Electorally, but, he's got to define himself and turn out that electorate. Yeah. Uh, but it, 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 it's, it's going to be a challenge. So what if he does prevail, if he is returned to the office, which is certainly possible, um, what does that mean for international reaction? Yep. You and our, 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 our foreign policy, U.S. foreign our policy? foreign policy. The, the Europeans are getting increasingly irritated with the Israeli policies mm. and with the war in Gaza as a very recent memory. Uh, they're saying, look, this, this can't continue. There's got to be an end that is promising for, uh, however difficult the talks, promising of a peaceable coexistence. Right. And with the way he's going, they don't see it happening. And Do I, you? Does any reasonable analyst? No. Uh, I've gotten fixated, as uh, most of my former colleagues, on the idea of a two-state solution. Right. Now, can some other formula be devised? That meets the criteria of justice, fairness, political determination. I don't know. It's, you know, we tend to forget that it's such an becoming an ancient political debate uh, yeah. that that we've had here. Uh, yeah, no, but the people in the area still care about the Palestinians. Yep. Yep. It's not yep. number one problem maybe for the Saudis today, for the Turks today, but it's a problem. And if the government of Israel says the hell with the Palestinians, we're going to build a strong, defensible state of Israel over the entire okay, let, area. Okay, let's do a little gaming this out. So that happens. What is the United States' response? Well, I, I think it has to, it will not drop the idea of a two-state solution. That's, that's become enshrined as and a that's got, I mean, and, and that is rock-solid, bipartisan, no disloyal opposition stuff. Yeah, as long as it doesn't pose a threat to Israeli security. Okay. And the prime minister has been saying, this is a clear threat to our security. I'm not going to be party to it. And this meaning the uh, a, a possible agreement with Iran among six nations regarding their nuclear program. Well, no, that's that's yet another messy situation. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, you talk about the one you want to talk no, about. No, no. Uh, I, I don't have much more to say about the Arab-Israeli situation. Right. The cause is still out there is all I'm trying to right. say. Right. Yeah. That, uh, as far well, as this, is, this exacerbates it. I mean, the yeah. bottom line is Netanyahu said never, 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 yeah. never. And that doesn't, that doesn't induce negotiation. Yeah. That induces you know, bloodshed. I mean, you, I mean, it's just asking for some kind of frustrated military response. Come on. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't surprise a lot of people that uh, uh, the Palestinian leadership has said, well, it's what we've been suspecting all along, trying to tell you he's not serious about a peace. Okay. Uh, okay. Talk. So we sort of know where Bibi's coming from and going to. Suppose if Herzog forms the government with the likely combination of parties, which is really, given I'm a total amateur, I can't figure that out. But let's say he gets the 61. Yeah. What's the difference in his outlook? I mean, certainly it's stated a difference. What is, what is it likely to be given Israeli internal political constraints? Well, uh, he, working with the Palestinian leadership, has to persuade the Israeli public that... Uh, a deal will not be a threat to their overall security and their existence as a, as a people in the region. Okay, now let's go from west to east. Israel and Iran, I mean, the major uh, news, headlines, uh, analysis is 
Netanyahu's speech before the Congress, the 47 Republicans writing a letter to Tehran, and the deeper question of, you know, a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. I mean, it's often not recognized that Israel has the bomb, and it's got more than a couple of them. Yeah. Anywhere between, what, 75 and 400 are estimates that I read. Yeah. So we're talking about a power that's got the bomb, and you've got a power that may or may not be seeking the ability to do it. And then the foreign leader comes to, at invitation of the Congress, to decry the pact. Republican senators then send a letter to Tehran. Your reaction as a, an old hand, long-time hand, a diplomat, respond. Well, uh, it's, it's the sort of challenge that uh, people in the State Department face pretty steadily uh, from the Congress. Are you trying to say that just because you're working on this 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that you know better what the American people need and what our nation needs than we in the Congress elected by those same people. Oh, well, you could do that. You could do that for a living. That was excellent. Yeah, well. You could sell out. <laughs> Go ahead. And there's a built-in tension in yeah. our system. Sure. There ought to be. Between the executive and this the legislative. Be. Fine. Uh, this went beyond the norm. Uh, uh, it was a bravura. Uh, performance by those 47 to say uh, we don't care uh, about what the president's policy is. We don't like the policy, and we're not going to support it in any way at any time. And don't sign on because it ain't going anywhere. Well, yeah. Then their argument to in their in their letter was uh, to the Iranians: don't be fooled. Our system that. Executive agreement could be disappearing the right, day that, he leaves office. Right, exactly. Which uh, is nonsense because if it works, if there is an agreement that's acceptable on both sides, and we don't know that. Right, right. It's if still it's problematic. It's going to endure as so many executive agreements of have course. endured from Republican gonna, to Democrat and back. Hopefully, it works in some yeah. meaningful sense. Yeah. Okay, talk about the speech and the letter. Well, it was a it was a flat out challenge to what uh, the administration has been trying to do, uh, convince that a better relationship uh, is going to be built on a credible denial of Iran's gaining a nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, the suspicions have been out there for thirty years right. that that's been their intent, building right. on the what was the Shah's right. Uh, nuclear interests back uh, when he was still in office. But that said... Uh, the IAEA has been looking at that forever. And, and has not been satisfied at with the all. answers that it's got. Whether on the, the al, al on through. The argument makes a great deal of sense that there's going to be less security for Iran and the region if Iran gets the bomb. Because it likely will stimulate an arms race uh, on the part of the Saudis, even the Egyptians, uh, Turks. other Turks, yes. Yeah. So you've got, you know, the nuclear club. Yeah. So right now you have one nuclear power in the region. Right. The uh, you have the Israelis there. You have the Pakistanis, the Indians. Just, right. Well, just the yeah. Side, and then, I mean, that's the, that's just yeah. throw weight. I mean, that's that's yeah. not distance at all. Yeah. yeah. You've got, and then Saudi Arabia. Signs an agreement with North Korea on nuclear fuel. Was that? Did I read that correctly? Uh, I've, I haven't tracked that one, but yes. Yeah, I think, I, I, I think there was some kind of uh, agreement uh, over there as well. Okay, let's let's now sort of focus in on the region and 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 what's going on, and. Uh, look at, you know, just look at a couple of maps. I mean, here you've got a map of the region that includes Egypt, Sudan, Iran. So here you will sort of have a macro picture. And if you look sort of left toward the top, you see Syria and Iraq. So th this is the region with Lebanon, Israel here, Jordan, Saudi Arabia. So this is the, 
the larger region. Mm -hmm. Now, within that larger region, as we'll be talking, is sort of the the battleground in Iraq and Syria, where you've got the the main fronts in this multilateral war among and between ISIS, Al Qaeda, uh, the Assad government, and there's more, I'm sure. And then you've got specifically, you know, what what the civil war really looks like on the map of Syria. So let's let's branch out from Syria. You you've been there. You represented the United States there. What is exactly happening in Syria right now? What 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 is sort of the constellation of forces and their likely playing out? Well, Syria's always been a a puzzle to Washington, an irritant and then a source of considerable anger because of the way it uh, uh, has developed its policies. It wouldn't join in the peace efforts back after the 73 war. It uh, moved slowly, very carefully, to saying, well, they could accept a peace of the brave. That was the uh, present president's father's statement right. in the late 90s. Uh, so they weren't totally rigid. But they were very, very uh, anxious to show that Syria is a key player and not Sadat, not Egypt. No, no. If you want peace, you've got to have uh, everybody at the table. All of the Arab players have to be there. And uh, a leader among them, if not the leader, was to be Syria. Mm -hmm. And the Egyptians had no patience with that. The Israelis had no patience. They signed a peace treaty and the world moved on. But that didn't minimize, uh, do away with the capability of the Syrians to make trouble. And when the Arab Spring hit in 2011, four years back and mm -hmm. more, a little more than four years, um, Bashar al-Assad said, well, th that doesn't involve us because there are, our people respect what we stand for. You were here, and we want to yeah, discuss yeah. it. Go ahead. We're against Zionism. Uh, we're constant about Arab national pride and dignity, and we're going to uphold those those issues. And our people admire us greatly. Well, the fact is, their people had been listening to the radio, watching the t television. They had access to the news, mm -hmm. and their young people wanted a voice, as the young people have been asking, demanding uh, across the region. Now, it hasn't worked out in favor of the young vote in Cairo today, but, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're more active and more involved than, than they were under the Mubarak regime, mm -hmm. Sadat, before him. Uh, Syria, the Syrian regime reacted four years ago with force. Any challenge was to be put down hard. Yep. After all, Hafez al-Assad did that in Hama when he turned the field artillery onto the city of Hama and crushed the Muslim Brotherhood movement. Well, he crushed it for the better part of a generation. So it was a success in, in the eyes of the regime, and they tried it again. It hasn't worked, and the country has disintegrated in front of our eyes these past uh, three years. So... Just, just lay out the major players here. I mean, you really need a scorecard. So you have a side. Yeah, well, you have... Let's do the internal players. Oh, no, you can't. Uh, it's a list which defies oh, okay, imagination. Okay, 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 okay. Lit literally, I mean, the militias on the ground in Syria today are in the hundreds. They may have 10 members, they may have 20 members, but they don't look to any leadership that could constitute a, a really unified military operation or, on the political side, a unified political stand. Frankly, uh, the Syrians, they're not very good at cooperating with one another. Um, we've tried, and that's, that's where our effort went uh, beginning 2011, to get the opposition elements together politically but they themselves have disagreements. Now, you and I have discussed this yeah. on innumerable occasions. I mean, any discussion about what's happening in Syria and in Iraq, 
always has to come back to Islam and the conflict between Sunnis and Shia. And we're seeing this played out again in with ISIS, ISIS and Iran, Iran's movement into Iraq. You know this far better than I. Well, it's, it's fine. There is a Sunni-Shia conflict uh, that you know, dates back to the first century of Islam. But that, that's not enough to explain no. what, what these ma no. maps no. are showing no. today. It's much more geopolitical. Right? So, yeah, it's uh, who is going to get to command the force that will, uh, that will govern. And ISIS has had a remarkable success in part because it's pulled into its ranks the officer corps of Saddam Hussein. The oh, well, we disbanded the army. Well, Come we, on. We abolished I mean, it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and that Smart move. First Paul, Paul Bramer. towards democratization yeah. of Iraq and the liberation of the Middle East. Another perverse consequence. I'm well, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, the people are paying a very high price for it in Iraq and uh, in humanitarian terms, worst of all, in Syria today. Uh, the refugee problem internally, externally, in the millions, and this, uh, and this, this is regional. I mean, <coughs> Turkey's is involved. I mean, we've got now. Yeah, okay, yeah, outside players galore. Okay. Yeah. okay, so focusing in now even cl more closely on ISIS. It's we talked about it the last time, the level of barbarity, whether it's in the treatment of human beings or the bulldozing of historic now, yeah. there's a real dark age nihilistic quality to this. Is there any way that soft power really is meaningful or is it that you need boots on the ground and you have to kill them all? Uh, I don't want to put it that starkly. Boots on the ground meaning our... No, somebody's, no boots. somebody's boots. Somebody's boots. Uh, Turkey's boots. Well, there's... Excuse me. It comes back to the question, what's it going to accomplish? Are, they, are the Syrians going to... The opposition, are they going to coalesce with a major foreign assistance? Uh, we've been criticized for not putting in enough. Enough money, enough ideas, enough... Uh, Political efforts to do arms it, to do what? But because you know, one one day we're with one of these tribal militias that you're talking about, yeah. and the next they're on the other side. Well, speaking of the voice of the people, Obama was reelected in part because the pledge was not to get our country into another Middle Eastern war. This is correct. Yeah. So uh, we shouldn't forget that, as he's criticized for being indecisive and too slow to move. Oh, I mean, from, from, from a, a strategic point of view, again, this is a little bit of soapbox here. I mean, it's utterly irresponsible on several levels, the, the letter and the, the, the military reaction to all of this. It's always bomb them, use muscle, yeah. and it's almost like... There's no learning curve. We, do you, we don't learn. We haven't given up entirely on the... I hate to preach, great, but I mean, well, I, I guess me, obviously love to preach. Let but. me pre preach back that, uh, you know, we've been the shining city on the hill, and we know what's good for the world. And if only the world would follow our uh, precepts, uh, it would be... A okay, so, okay, okay, so we've got 47 senators directly challenging... Yeah. The foreign policy and foreign policy prerogative of a duly elected, majority elected, popular and electorally vote, re-elected president of the United States. And I don't see, I'm not a constitutional scholar, but this really is an intrusion into the executive. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. is legislative coup too strong a word? I don't know. No, uh, because they haven't succeeded. Attempt. They haven't right. succeeded. Go ahead. You're had, had you've, they, you've been talked well, to that. Go to the calendar. Uh, there's supposed to be uh, an effort underway as we talk that would produce by the end of March a framework agreement between Iran mm -hmm. and the uh, powers, including Russia and China. Yeah, the six. P5 plus one. Yeah. Uh, group uh, on a, uh, a, a aimed at denying a uh, 
the government of Iran a prospect of getting a surprise move underway to mm -hmm. launch a nuclear sure. arms effort. And how that's going to come out isn't clear. It, it sure isn't clear to 47 senators. It's not clear to you or to me today if such a framework agreement can be agreed. Right. But it was uh, politically the, opportune, domestically opportune to make yep, that strike yep. and write that You've got to do it. Yeah. You've got to do it. Um, reaction of, to the letter? Well, it, it was capitalized on by the... Uh, by Ayatollah Khamenei in Tehran, saying, yeah, see, that we've told you, they're not serious. They're, they're talking I, about burning, okay, okay, okay. Let, burning up well, the agreement. What was the, I, I'm trying to figure out, what was the strategic goal of the letter, other than, you know, sort of schoolboy, macho nonsense? It, it, it weakens U.S. position. Yeah. Why are they hurting the nation? in terms of getting at the president. I mean, I, again, I'm, I'm sorry well, for that. Well, again, the saying used to be, and I, I think I'm quoting George Schultz correctly, we can't afford 465 secretaries of state, or however members, number of members. 35. 435, okay. Yes. You're a good student. Well, that's, uh, go ahead, come on, we're running out of time. <laughs> anyway. Uh, you know, the world does expect us to have a policy. It doesn't expect the United States to be without controversy in developing the policy, but that the President of the United States has to have credibility in developing it and, and stating it. And it's not only this President, they don't look beyond this President for at least the short term? Come on. Not, not a, been... this escapade, no, no. Okay. This was designed okay. as a flash embarrassment, I, I think. So you're going to come back after this March 30th deal? The, let's say the end of June and we're going to figure all this out? No. Uh, we will, well, that, that was the second date. The end of June was supposed to be a final agreement. Dying right. All the eyes okay. crossing the teeth. You'll, you'll be back because this, this never stops and I have too much fun. Yeah. Okay. okay. My special thanks to Ambassador Murphy to once again helping us untie or retie the Gordian knot called the Middle East. Join us next week when my guest will be Tom Robbins, investigative journalist extraordinaire, and reporters Laura Bolt and Sarah Barrett on the rap sheet trap here on CUNY TV. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email, whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it, send it.